there folks, Tim Slade here from the eLearning Designers Academy and Community. Thank you so much for checking out this how-to workshop. If you've never watched or attended one of my how-to workshops before, these sessions are designed to be practical sessions that provide tips and tricks uh, on all things e-learning design and instructional design. Now, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube and you haven't done so already, make sure to click that like, subscribe, and that bell button so that you can get alerted the next time I publish a video just like this one. And of course, make sure to join us inside the e-learning designers community at community.elearningacademy.io where you can connect, network, and learn from others in our industry. All right, so for today's how-to workshop, I'm gonna be talking about how to design e-learning that doesn't suck. And I know that seems kind of harsh to say, but I'm gonna admit something to you. I think most e-learning sucks. Yeah, I know. Even though I've been designing e-learning for years and years and years, I think most of it is actually really bad. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons behind that, which we'll get into today. I'll admit, I'll be the first to admit, I've created really bad e-learnings uh, in my time, and I'm sure all of you have as well. You know, one of the things I always tell people when I'm talking about uh, e-learning, uh, and I always like to start off by telling a little bit about my story about how I fell into e-learning. One of the things I always tell people is I'm not really an e-learning designer. I really struggle with that identity. Uh, I really, really am uncomfortable when people say expert or uh, thought leader or any of those uh, weird words that people use to describe uh, somebody like myself who's been working in this industry for 15 years. I don't really consider myself an expert or a thought leader or any of those things. And it's kind of this imposter syndrome I've carried around for years and years and years because um, I never dreamed of being an e-learning designer when I was growing up. You know, when I was a kid, I dreamed of being things like an astronaut and an actor and at one point a lawyer for some reason and then I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be all these things and I'll tell you e-learning designer and instructional designer was never on the list. At least it was never on the top of the list. It was never on the list, I promise you. I actually, I have a background in criminal justice. Uh, I don't have any formal training or background in instructional design or adult learning theory or education. I used to quite literally catch shoplifters for a living. Uh, I worked in retail loss prevention in this tiny little camera room in the corner of a store where I watched all these cameras all day and I caught shoplifters. And before I got into loss prevention, I actually worked as a mall cop, like a literal mall cop. <laughs> I had the uniform just like that you see here on the screen, except it was during the, during the days when we actually walked around the mall. Um, you know, I didn't get to ride around on a Segway, unfortunately. I progressed into the prestigious world of, of loss prevention before they introduced the Segways. Um, but the reason I tell that story is because, uh, you know, at that time in my career, I thought loss prevention was what I was going to be doing forever. I mean, that's why I got a degree in criminal justice. But one day my boss came along and he said, hey, Tim, you're really good at catching shoplifters, which I was. And I really loved catching shoplifters. And I still, I would, if, if I could have a part-time job, if I had time for a part-time job, I'd be catching shoplifters, trust me. Uh, he said, you're really great at catching shoplifters. You should be training others on how to catch shoplifters. And I thought, yeah, oh my gosh, that would be so cool, right? Like I get to take all of my knowledge and expertise and help other new loss prevention people learn how to catch shoplifters. Well, there just so happened to be a training coordinator job that had opened up uh, at the corporate offices in the retail store that I was working at at the time. And I flew across the country and I interviewed for this job. I was like 23 years old. I'd just barely been living on my own at the time. And I ended up getting this job. I don't know how I got the job, but I got the job. And so I packed up my really crappy Ford Focus with a really grumpy cat. And I drove across country thinking, I'm going to take this job as a training coordinator at the corporate offices on the corporate loss prevention training team. And it's totally going to advance and propel my loss prevention career. I'm going to be like the corporate loss prevention guy now. And that first year in the job, uh, I had what I call a career identity crisis. Um, that first year on the job was probably the hardest year I've ever experienced in my career because I'll tell you, I had no clue what I was doing. My first project, this image you see here on the right, uh, this first project I worked on was a series of five e-learning courses on the process for catching shoplifters. And uh, it involved us going out to stores and hiring these actors and filming all these scenarios. I mean, it was trial by fire. I was thrown in the deep end of the pool. It was like drinking from a fire hose. Like I was clueless, but I kind of just figured it out as I went along. And I realized at one point that I was no longer recognized as the corporate loss prevention guy. I was recognized as 
the trainer, <laughs> the instructional designer, the e-learning designer, who just so happened to be creating training content on the topic of loss prevention. And I discovered that I really enjoyed creating digital learning content. I enjoyed e-learning. So I had this career identity crisis and I decided uh, at that time, almost a little over, almost 15 years ago, to pursue e-learning. I realized that I discovered something in myself that I never knew was there. I say that story, I tell you that story, because I think it plays into a, lo a lot of the reasons why a lot of e-learning fails. Uh, the great thing about our industry is that there's so many people like me who are good at something and then fell into e-learning by total accident. And uh, they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> they don't know what good instructional design is. And they end up creating really bad courses. It's the special thing about our industry, but it's also kind of the curse as well. At the time, I thought I was the only one who, you know, I, I thought it was the exception to the rule that I found e-learning, but I found out that most people don't dream of being e-learning designers. And so the question I want, I want to ask you rhetorically, or if you want to share your thoughts by commenting below down in the comments, why do you think most e-learning fails? Why does most e-learning fail? Well, like I said, I think because there's a lot of people like me who fell into this industry uh, and uh, are creating uh, courses, not really having any idea what they're doing. And there's a whole bunch of other reasons which I want to get into today. You know, the common answers that people give is it's not engaging, it's too boring, it's too much information, it's too much content. Uh, and, and those are all accurate <laughs> reasons why a lot of e-learning fails. Um, for me, I think, you know, I'll get into the more of the specifics on why I think e-learning fails, but I think a lot of it comes down to the people that we work with as learning professionals. You know, um, we have people tell us, stakeholders, subject matter experts, or maybe sometimes we say this to ourselves, is we just need to track and verify that they know this info. So we create an e-learning course, or uh, let's just throw it into an e-learning course, right? Because it's convenient, right? We take some PowerPoint slides, add a next button. Maybe if we want to get really you know, snazzy, we add a quiz, we publish it in the LMS, and we call it training, right? That's convenient, right? You can create e-learning once, deliver it multiple times to multiple learners, multiple locations, and we think that's training. You know, the, the, one of the main issues that I think e-learning fails are the stories that we tell ourselves as learning professionals. You know, when I was new to e-learning, I thought e-learning was like the end-all be-all. And I thought, my God, my learners are going to love my e-learning courses. Uh, I was really overzealous about e-learning. Uh, and I thought, you know, my learners are going to sit there, take that course and go, gosh, I just love that e-learning course. But there's a disparity there because there's this disparity of what we think is reality, especially when you're new to training and e-learning. And then, you know, actual reality. The truth is most of our learners don't love our e-learning courses, uh, even though we like to tell ourselves that, even though our stakeholders and subject matter experts like to believe that. Uh, the reality is, is that most of the courses we probably create aren't all that, uh, all that interesting or all that good or all that helpful. So I'm going to show you this example. This example I'm going to show you is an excerpt from a course, uh, a real course that I encountered earlier in my career. And uh, I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing. We're going to maybe watch, you know, 45 seconds to a minute. Uh, and then I want to ask you some questions about it. So let's go and watch the example, and then uh, I'll ask you some fun questions about this. Now that you understand our company's values, you'll now learn the three steps for providing feedback in nine box placement. Step one, provide feedback on nine box placement. In step one, Leaders will discuss positive and actionable developmental feedback. While we're making big improvements to how we evaluate performance, some employees still don't understand how their performance is evaluated. Leaders, please do what you can to emphasize that the what plus the how equals our results, which is all about being extraordinary to make a difference in the world. As a reminder, the what is performance relative to goals and impact based on expectations at one's okay. level, and the how is performance relative... I'm not going to make you watch any more of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a horrible e-learning example, right? But let me ask you this. Have you ever seen that course before? Like not literally that course, but have you seen that type of course before? Have you ever created that type of course before, right? If you're really brave, you probably admit that you have. I know I have. I've created those types of courses before. Let me ask you some questions about that course. You know, even though we didn't watch the whole thing, the whole three minutes, I believe it was. Uh, let me ask you some questions that technically you should have been able to answer after watching it. So... What are the three steps to the mid-year conversation? What are the two components of our results? What are the three steps or the three parts of the how? What are the four things you should do as you review goals? What are the three parts of a development plan conversation? 
What are the three steps in identifying development opportunities? What are the nine examples of how we develop? What are the four things you should write in a development plan? And as you were watching the training, how'd you keep track of the 31 different parts straight in your head? Now, even though we didn't watch the whole three minutes of that awful recording of that e-learning, that e-learning course, I have to use air quotes there, uh, that excerpt, that 30, that three minute excerpt uh, included 31 different things that employees were to remember to do, to say, uh, to, to complete as part of the mid-year, end of year review process. And that three minute excerpt, even though we didn't watch all three minutes, was three minutes from a 30 minute e-learning course that all employees and managers had to go through twice per year as they prepped for the mid-year, end of year performance review process. Now, let me tell you a story about that particular course. Uh, that course um, uh, was a course that I first encountered when I took over uh, leading an instructional design team at a previous company. And I just so happened to be joining right during the uh, mid-year, end-of-year review process. And one of the first things I had to do as a new manager was watch that 30-minute course. And I remember thinking at the time, my gosh, this is just such an awful course. So of course, what I did is I was like, well, let me record it so I can use it as a non-example. So I can use it for this very moment right now <laughs> to show people this is not what you're supposed to be doing. But the history of that course, just to give context, that course was um, a course that was created. Uh, the slides, the script, all of that was something that was created by uh, the chief human resources officer at this company that I was working at. And they would, twice per year, put together this PowerPoint file and then hand it off to the instructional design team, the team that I ended up taking over, and mandated that that course got uploaded into uh, Articulate Storyline. We add a next button and then publish it into the LMS. Now, beyond the fact that, you know, the slides were awful, <laughs> it's too much content, you know, the, the, the robotic voice, which by the way, the only reason that there's robotic voice is because this person would deliver the slides at like 11 p.m. the Sunday before the Monday uh, that all this, you know, this course would have to go out to all employees. So that's all there was time for was to use the robotic voice. Um, the reason that course was created was because it was mandated by a stakeholder subject matter expert. Well, I'll give them credit. They were very passionate about the topic, but every year, twice per year, that course would get delivered and then everyone would have to sit through it. And then everyone would sit on their hands going, well, why, why didn't people master the mid-year end of year review process, right? Most seen learning fails because it looks like what I just described there. Now, in my opinion, there are really three reasons why most e-learning fails uh, and why it also sucks. Three really core uh, issues here. And this is what I wanna talk about today. In my opinion, most e-learning fails because first, it's not designed for how people learn. Uh, we create content, we create training experiences uh, that are designed to communicate information to another human being, but we don't do a good job creating training content that actually helps people learn how to do something. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The next reason it's not the right solution for the performance issue. We create training for non-training issues all the time, uh, rather than creating training that's actually focused on fixing performance issues. Uh, we create training for all sorts of other issues. We'll talk about that. And then it's not designed for what people need to do. We do a really good job creating training for what people need to know on the job, but we don't do a really good job focusing on what people need to do on the job. We'll talk about that. So let's start by focusing on designing for how people learn. So let me ask this question again, feel free to put your thoughts down in uh, the comments below, or I'm just asking this rhetorically, how do people learn? How does learning occur? Now, as you think about that question, I think one of the things we do in our industry is we overcomplicate this. We overcomplicate what it means to define how people learn or how does learning occur. We fill it with all sorts of buzzwords. We talk about gamification, microlearning, behaviorism, constructivism, uh, andragogy, pedagogy, pedagogy. All these things, I think, complicate what it means to understand how people learn. The reality is, is that people have been learning for decades, for eons, for century, for millennia. And nothing has changed about the way people learn. People learn through trial and error. People learn by taking in information, having an experience, and then learning from that experience, and then rinse and repeat. We've been learning since we're, we came out of our mother's womb. Uh, that's how learning occurs. Let me give you a great example. You know, let's say I wanted to learn how to bake a cake. Let's say I'm going to a friend's birthday party and I've been assigned the wonderful task of baking the birthday cake, but I've never baked a cake before, right? How can I learn how to bake a cake? Well, 
I could go uh, look up a recipe in a cookbook. I could go watch a YouTube video on baking cakes, right? But the act of reading a recipe in a cookbook or watching a YouTube video online, neither of those actions actually mean that I've learned how to bake a cake, right? We know that, right? In order to learn how to bake the cake, I actually have to go try and bake the cake. I have to take that information I obtained through the cookbook or on the YouTube video and then actually go attempt to bake a cake, right? And then what will probably happen is that I'll create a really bad cake and I'll know that because I'll taste the cake and I'll go, gosh, this is awful. I, didn't, I mixed it too much. I added too much flour. I baked it for too long, whatever the case might be, right? And I'll throw that cake away and then I'll bake another cake and then I'll try it and rinse and repeat. That's how learning occurs. Learning occurs through trial and error and through experiences. It's really not complicated. And that's why I think it's so important that we as learning professionals, whether you're creating e-learning or anything else in the world, it's important to recognize that learning isn't an event. It's a process. I think one of the things in our industry, uh, learning and development, instructional design, education in general, is that we sometimes conflate what it means to learn something versus training. And learning and training are two very different things. We treat learning as an event. We take people and we put them through an e-learning course, through a workshop, read uh, instructions in a cookbook, watch a YouTube video, and then we say, great, learning has occurred. Well, no, that's not at all what's happened. That was a training event. Learning isn't an event, it's a process. And one of the things that I believe uh, very strongly is that learning is actually an ecosystem of experiences where people experience something, they take in information, they apply it, they make mistakes, they, they learn from those, and then they continue on. And so the question we have to be asking ourselves as uh, instructional designers, and e-learning developers creating content for other adults is not how do people learn? We have to be asking ourselves, well, how do adults learn, right? Because here's the reality. What's happening here in a classroom is different than what happens when people are on the job. And sometimes we treat them as the same thing. We put our adults in the classroom, we put them behind the keyboard of a computer, we lecture to them, and then we expect learning to occur. Well, that's not how learning occurs for adults. That's not how we optimize training for adults. And we know that because there's research to back it up. Malcolm Knowles uh, identified the differences between adult learners and children learners and how we optimize our training experiences, our learning experiences for those two different audiences. Pedagogy, the method and practice of teaching children, and andragogy, the method and practice of teaching adults. And what Malcolm Knowles discovered is that there's all these differences between adult learners and children learners. Uh, everything from the learner and what experiences they bring to the table and how they apply those experiences. The readiness to learn. You know, when you think about children, um, children in a school environment learn because that's what's mandated to them. Uh, was for adults, readiness to learn, usually something changes in their lives, changes in their work environment, and it triggers a need to learn. Uh, or even motivation for learning, right? There's different motivators uh, between adults and children. Uh, one might be motivated towards grades or advancement, right? Whereas motivation to, for, for adults might be promotion, making their lives easier, earning more money, right? There's all these differences. And so what Malcolm Knowles identified are four principles of adult learning. And when you think about the types of training experiences you create, ask yourself whether or not you're embedding these principles in the experiences you create. So his first principle is, I, as an adult learner, I learn when I'm involved in the planning of my learning and development. Adult learners want to be involved in the planning, the execution of their learning. They don't want to just be mandated what and how they have to learn something. They want to have some involvement in saying that. I, as an adult learner, learn through action and reflecting on ways to improve my performance. I want to learn by doing the thing that I'm supposed to be doing, and then probably I'm going to fail. And then I will learn through that failure because I'll get to reflect on what I did right, what I did wrong. I, as a learner, uh, as an adult learner, I learn when I'm challenged by problems rather than merely hearing the solution, right? We don't want to just tell our adult learners what they should and should not do. We want to learn by, chall by challenging them. They want to learn by being challenged with re real world problems. And then I, as an adult learner, I learn when the subject is relevant to me and it's something that I care about. Adult learners are constantly evaluating whether or not what they're learning is going to help them do something different or better in their lives. Relevancy is so important. And if we go back to that really awful e-learning example I showed you, this is just another screenshot from it. 
That course violated all of those things. Learners weren't involved in the planning and execution of that. They were just mandated to take this 30-minute course. Uh, there was no action or practice of the tasks or behaviors at hand. Uh, was it relevant to them? Maybe for newer managers, but there was a whole, probably a whole group of managers who've been through this course dozens of times before who didn't really need this. Uh, and then there was no challenge, right? People are just told what you were supposed to do, what you need to do, what you don't do, right? The, this course violated all of those principles, and that's why it wasn't successful. It was never successful, right? And how many of the courses are you creating fall into that category as well, right? Uh, where it violates those principles. So I wanna go back to talking about learning not being an event, right? We talked about how training and learning are not the same thing. Uh, they're two different things. Learning is the res hopefully the result of training and experience over time, and learning is not an event, it's a process. Um, and learning is an ecosystem of experiences. One of the things as we think about how adults learn, one of the mistakes that we often make is we do these one and done trainings, right? where we put somebody through a course, they go through an instructor-led training, and then that's it. And then we expect them to have mastered something. And that's because that never works because that's not how learning works, right? So if we were to look at the retention of knowledge and skills uh, over the course of time, what we find is that when we have one and done training events, you have a training event and we see you know, progression in the learning curve. And then eventually the forgetting curve sets in, right? And we see a reduction in the knowledge and skill because they haven't been engaged in that content anymore. I mean, think about how many times you've had training where uh, when the training occurred and when the information actually, or those skills ideally, were applied on the job were like weeks or even months from apart, apart from one another, right? The thing that you learned weeks or months ago, you're not gonna remember it when you actually need to apply it. That's what happens when you do one and done training events. And so what we need to be doing instead, even if your primary focus is the, the design and development of e-learning, we need to be focused on supporting that ecosystem of learning over time and how learning occurs over time. And we do that through blended spaced training, right? So you have a training event, then you have a learning curve, and then the forgetting curve sets in, and then maybe you hit the learner with a retraining event. And then the forgetting curve sets in a little bit more. Maybe we hit them with some coaching and feedback and then some performance support, right? And what that allows us to do is it allows us to fight or uh, battle against that forgetting curve over time. And so what we need to be doing, again, even if your primary focus is on the design and development of e-learning, I think it's incumbent upon us as e-learning designers and developers and as learning professionals in general to be focused on how do we create blended learning to support the learning experience over time. One of my big pet peeves, uh, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, this has happened to me several times, you know, when you're starting a new training project, e-learning or otherwise, at some point, the question gets asked, should this be an e-learning course or should it be an ILT, an instructor-led training? Or should this be a how-to video or should it be a job aid? And one of the things I've come to learn and one of the things that I recognize is that learning isn't one thing or another. Learning isn't a binary choice between e-learning or instructor-led training or uh, a how-to video or a job aid, right? Learning isn't a binary thing between two things and why should training be either, right? And so even if your primary job is to design e-learning, you have to be thinking about how do we support that e-learning and where do we position it in that e-learning ecosystem, the ecosystem of experiences, right? And so the question is, how do we create blended learning? This is another thing that I think we've overcomplicated in our industry. I think we've made it complicated to design blended learning. And I think it's because we have all these buzzwords that are flying at us every year. There's a new thing that we uh, put our focus on. Creating blended learning is actually way simpler than uh, I think we make it out to be. The first thing that we need to identify if you're thinking about designing blended learning is you need to ask yourself, well, what am I looking to achieve through the training experience, right? Ask yourself that. And I, ideally, you'll be able to answer that if you've crafted really uh, good performance uh, learning objectives you know, with action verbs. Uh, you might identify that you need to transfer knowledge or information. Yeah, I know. I'm going to tell you in a moment why knowledge and behavior aren't mutually exclusive and we shouldn't be focusing on knowledge. But sometimes that's something you need to do. Just transfer some knowledge. Or maybe we need to create opportunities for practice uh, of the task or the behavior right, in a training environment. Or maybe we need to create opportunities for application of the task or behaviors on the job. Or maybe we just need to assess knowledge, uh, assess their performance, right? Or maybe we're just providing some on-the-job performance support. 
or just-in-time performance support. Truth is, uh, with most training uh, interventions that you might be creating, whether it involves e-learning or not, you're doing a combination of all of these things. You need to transfer some knowledge, create practice, application assessment, and just-in-time performance support. The mistake that I think a lot of people make is when they try to do all of these things in one big massive course, right? And the truth is, is you don't have to do it in one big massive course. You can break these things out into different modalities that are scaffold and support one another. And yeah, it might involve e-learning. It might not. It might be e-learning might be the primary component, but it might also include job aids and other uh, learning objects to support it. So once you can identify what it is that you're trying to create through the training experience, what you can then do is start pairing those learning outcomes with different training objects, right? So think of all the different ways you can transfer knowledge or information, a lecture, a presentation, an explainer video, infographics, job aids, articles, blogs, communications even. You can transfer knowledge with non-training interventions as well. Think of all the ways you can create uh, opportunities for practice or application, role playing, digital scenarios, on the job practice, observation with coaching and feedback, assessment of knowledge and behaviors, right? It might be a knowledge based quiz, a performance based quiz, uh, performance assessment. It might just be observation or looking at KPIs and other data to assess knowledge or performance. And then just in time performance support, right? It might be a job aid, an online resource, a handout. Uh, a video, article, blog, documented best practices. I could go on and on and on. So let me give you an example of how, uh, if you can identify what it is you need to achieve and then mix and match that and pair that with different training objects, how, you, how easy it is to create a blended experience. So let's say, for example, you're launching a new system that all employees need to know how to use at your organization, right? So that's the thing we need to do. They need to be able to use the new system. Yeah, you could create one big massive e-learning course to teach that, or even an instructor-led training, bring everybody into the office for a day of training on this new system. Again, if you just do one and done training, the likelihood is, is they're gonna forget that over time. So what do we do? Well, we know we need to transfer knowledge about the new system, we need to do that. Uh, maybe we need to create some opportunities for our learners to practice uh, using the new system or the new workflows they'll be doing. And we know we need to provide some performance support on the new system long after the training is over, right? So how can we transfer knowledge about the new system? Well, maybe we'll just do an explainer video and then we'll send that out with some email communications, right? Leading up to them practicing using the new system. And maybe that's done with a system simulation. We create that in an e-learning authoring tool that goes in the LMS and they can practice all of those different things in a training environment, right? Or they could do it in the classroom, either way. Uh, and then performance, right? Maybe we create some online job aids, even if the primary thing you're creating, let's say you're an e-learning designer, because that's what we're focusing on, right? Even if your primary job is creating e-learning and creating a system simulation to support the launch of this new system, is it really that much more of a stretch to also create a video and email that out to your learners and then also create some job aids to support your learners after they finish your e-learning course, right? Creating blended learning isn't complicated. It's just looking at how do we support our learners before, during, and after the primary training event, again, to support the training experience, the learning experience over time. All right, so we talked about it not being designed for how people learn. That's the first reason why training fails. It's not just about creating e-learning and being done with it. It's about creating and supporting the learning experience, even if your primary job is to create e-learning. All right, so the next reason I think a lot of e-learning fails is because it's not the right solution for the performance issue. One question I want you to ask yourself, and again, feel free to comment down in chat uh, or down in the discussion. When is training the answer? When does it make sense to create training? You know, one of the things that anybody who's been working in this industry for any amount of time, one of the things that they know to be true is that their stakeholders and subject matter experts think everything can be fixed with training. And the reality is, is that I think our job as instructional designers, as learning professionals, however you define yourself, I think our job is less about identifying when training is the answer. I think our job is to identify when is training not the answer. And I think it's our job to actually talk our stakeholders and our subject matter experts out of training because they think training can fix everything. I also think that um, on any training project you might be working on, whether it's e-learning or something else, I think there's this one moment that dictates everything else in terms of whether or not what you're working on is going to be successful. And it's the moment somebody comes and asks you, hey, we need to create some training. How you respond at that very moment 
Whether you go, yeah, let's create some training. Let's take the request and just go with it. Or you start asking more questions, digging deeper. How you respond when you reach that fork in the road dictates whether anything else is going to be successful that you do. And so one of the things that I think we as instructional designers, as learning professionals, as e-learning developers, e-learning designers, our job is not just to say, yes, Mr. or Mrs. Stakeholder, subject matter expert, I'll create some training. Our job is to go, great, let's ask some more questions to figure out what's really going on. And the thing that we really have to understand and we have to help our stakeholders understand is why don't employees perform the way we want, right? That's ultimately the goal of what we're trying to achieve through any sort of training, right? We want to, we want to make people do the things we want them to do on the job because they're probably not, right? Well, there's a lot of different reasons why people don't do things on the job, right? It might be a lack of knowledge. Maybe they don't know how to do something or it might be a lack of skill. Maybe... Uh, they know how to do something, but they don't have the right level of expertise or they haven't had enough practice to do it at the expected level. Maybe they're not motivated to do it, right? They know how to do it. They're experienced at it, but they're just not motivated to do it. Or maybe there's something wrong with the environment. And when I say environment, I'm not talking about like the environment, like outside. I'm talking about the performance environment, right? The question we have to ask ourselves is, well, which of these can training actually fix? The truth is we can't do anything about motivation or the environment. The only thing we can fix as learning professionals, as e-learning designers, developers, are issues that are, that are of the result of a lack of knowledge or skill. Let me give you a great example. Let's say um, you're creating training or you're asked to create training for some salespeople because they aren't selling enough things. They aren't selling enough iPhones or enough, you know, wallets, right? And your stakeholder comes to you and says, hey, we need you to create some training because we want to increase sales of these wallets. Well, if you really dig into the issue, you might discover that the reason employees or your salespeople aren't selling as many wallets as they should be is because they're actually commissioned more to sell charging blocks, right? In that instance, there's no really amount of training that's going to fix the fact that the reason that they're selling more of these than these is because they're more motivated to because they get more commission, right? That's a motivational issue. You need to change the way people are motivated. Or environment. Let's say at a grocery store, you know, the cashiers are expected to scan so many items per minute, but you find that they aren't scanning as many as they should be. So a stakeholder says, hey, let's create some training on how to scan uh, more items per minute. But if you dig into it, you might discover, well, that conveyor belt that moves all of the grocery items to the scanner doesn't move as quickly as you think it is. And so it's not really possible for them to scan that many items per minute. Or it's harder because it's not bringing the items to the cashier as fast as you would like it to be. There's no amount of training that's going to fix that, right? That's an issue that has to be fixed by some other means. My point in saying that is, is that as instructional designers, as learning professionals, when we look at addressing a performance issue, we have to identify what are other contributing factors that might be affecting performance beyond just simply a lack of knowledge or skill. And of course, our stakeholders are always going to believe training is the answer. It's convenient for them. It means they don't have to go fix motivational issues that their employees are experiencing or fix the environment issues that might be affecting performance. So how do we identify this? How do I identify what are the, the, the uh, contributing factors to a performance issue before we start building training? Well, the way that we do that, the way that we validate the cause of a performance issue is by doing a needs analysis. Now, I'll be completely straightforward and honest. I used to be so intimidated by needs analyses when I was early in my career. I thought it meant crunching tons of numbers in Excel and analyzing data. And yeah, that might be a part of it. But one of the things I've learned over the years is that conducting a needs analysis is way more simpler than I think we make it out to be. But first, let me let me address this issue here, because I think there's a misconception about what a needs analysis is actually meant to accomplish. I think there's some people who think a needs analysis, the purpose of doing a needs analysis is to identify what types of what types of training might fix the issue. The reality is, is a needs analysis, in my opinion, is not about identifying what types of training might fix the performance issue. A needs analysis to identify why there's a performance issue in the first place. And so a needs analysis is the process of evaluating an issue, a performance issue, to determine the root cause. So evaluate a performance issue, determine the root cause, and offer one or more solutions, whether that be training or something else, right? And once you've done that, then you can identify and help your stakeholders understand and how to move forward with informed 
uh, solutions that will actually help address the performance issue. And it may be training, it may not be training, or it might be a combination of those things. Now, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this section, it's this, because this is why it's so important that you do some sort of needs analysis before you accept any sort of training request. Because here's the thing, if you don't know why a performance issue exists, you run the risk of creating learning solutions for non-learning problems. And I'll repeat that. If you don't know why a performance issue exists, you run the risk of creating learning solutions or training solutions for non-learning or non-training problems. And you know what that is? It's a waste of time. It's a waste of your learner's time by putting them through courses that are actually going to help them do things on the job, which ultimately just annoys the heck out of them because it's wasting their time uh, from being on the job. It's going to be a waste of your stakeholders and subject matter experts time by creating solutions that they think are going to drive business results when in reality it's not going to drive any sort of business results. It's a waste of your time by creating stuff that isn't actually going to you know, uh, help people do things on the job and it's a waste of your organization's time and money because uh, you're not creating something that actually helps your organization. So how do you, do, how do you conduct a needs analysis? Again, I used to be so intimidated by this. Uh, but I found that conducting a needs analysis is way simpler than we make it out to be. For me, I think most needs analyses, no matter what your process looks like, it comes down to answering three basic questions. Uh, the first question is, what are people doing? What are people currently doing on the job? Now, usually that's a pretty easy question to be able to answer. Your stakeholder subject matter experts will likely tell you what people are doing on the job and you can go observe it. You can go validate what's the current level of performance. The second question you have to ask and answer is, what do you want people doing, right? Again, this is one that usually your stakeholders and subject matter experts will be able to very easily answer, right? Because the reason they're coming to you is because there's something that they want their employees doing that they're not currently doing, right? So identifying what's the current level of performance, what's the desired level of performance. And then the third and most important question you have to ask and answer is why aren't people doing it? What's the cause? What's the cause between the current level of performance and the desired level of performance? The third question is the hardest one to answer because your stakeholders, your subject matter experts, and even you might just assume it's training, right? But this is where you have to dig deeper and identify what are the actual issues that are happening. I can't tell you how many times I've worked on projects where uh, I've accepted a training request. I've started creating training and ask a lot of questions and you get about 60% into it, right? And through that time, you've gained more context and understanding and you have like this, oh crap moment. You go, oh crap. You just, it dawns on you that you realize this is probably not going to do the thing that I think we thought it was going to do, right? Because you've gained more context. The whole point of doing a needs analysis and asking these questions is for you to have that moment of realiz realization way earlier in the whole process before you've invested time building anything so that you can actually build the thing that's going, is, that's going to change the performance that you're looking to change. So how do you do this? How do you answer these questions? Well, you start by talking to your stakeholders and subject matter experts, right? These are usually the people coming to you with the training request. But the thing to remember is that you don't always want to trust everything that they tell you. You want to trust but verify, right? Uh, and the way that you do that is you start reviewing data. Is there any data that might inform the current level of performance, the desired level of performance, and the cause between the difference there, right? Uh, maybe you go observe employees, see what's happening, see what they're doing, see what they're struggling with. And if you can, go talk to the employees, go talk to your learners and find out what are they struggling with. Talk to the people who are uh, operating at the desired level of performance and find out how did they learn to do the things that they're doing on the job. And maybe you go review best practices. I can't tell you how many times I've received training requests in my career where the, the cause of the lack of performance was either a lack of a best practice or uh, a, a, a disconnect between what the best practice said and what people actually wanted them doing on the job, right? This is just a high level overview of some of the things that you can do to conduct your needs analysis. And the, I, the goal is for you to create a snapshot and an understanding of what's actually happening in reality, rather than just having to put all of your faith and trust in your stakeholders and subject matter experts. Because again, they're gonna think everything could be fixed through training. All right, so we talked about it not being the right solution for the performance issue. Uh, the third and final reason I think training fails that we're going to talk about is it not being designed for what people need to do. Um, 
I think, like I said earlier, we do a really good job in our industry designing e-learning or designing training for what people need to know. But when it comes to e-learning, specifically e-learning, the thing that I think is really critical to designing e-learning that doesn't suck (laughs) is designing performance-based e-learning. E-learning that's focused on what people need to actually do on the job rather than just what they need to know. And so what we have to ask ourselves is how do we design performance-based e-learning? focus on what people need to do instead of what they need to know. Now I'm gonna go back to this image here. I talked to you, I I mentioned earlier that at this moment, when you're meeting meeting with a stakeholder or subject matter expert and they say, hey, we need some training. It's this moment that's the most critical one. Um, And uh, one of the things that I've learned over time is that I never use the word no with my stakeholders and subject matter experts. And by no, I mean K-N-O-W. I never use no. I never ask what do people need to know or be aware of or understand uh, in the course. I always talk about what do people need to do once they complete this course. And the reason why I say that is because it's my belief that learners don't need to know anything. Our learners don't need to know things. They need to be able to do things on the job. And let me give you a really great example. I want you to take a guess at what you think this image is here. What do you think that is, right? Just take a wild guess. You can ask yourself. It's a rhetorical question. Uh, Well, it's a bomb. (laughs) It's an improvised explosive device. And I know that's kind of like this M. Night Shyamalan twist in my presentation for today. Um, But hear me out here. Years ago, I uh, worked on a project uh, where we were creating an e-learning course, a set of e-learning courses for military contractors. And these military contractors, they were like plumbers, electricians, other trades that would go into war zones with the military to support whatever operations were going on there. And the purpose of this training was to help these military contractors to be able to identify and avoid improvised explosive devices, these homemade bombs that get buried in the ground on dirt roads that are obviously, as you can imagine, very deadly, right? And as we were working with these stakeholders and subject matter experts, Uh, they wanted to include this really extensive introduction about the history of explosives, the history of gunpowder, how they was created hundreds and thousands of years ago for fireworks and how these bombs are made and all sorts of really interesting information. And it's only natural. I mean, like I said, you know, your stakeholders, your subject matter experts, they're experts for a reason, right? And one of the things that they expect is or one of their desires is that everyone else is equally as passionate and knowledgeable as they are about their given thing. But usually that's really unreasonable and usually it's unnecessary. And this is a great example of that. This training was one of, you know, one of the rare instances where it's literally, literally life and death. And so what we have to explain to these, this client, these subject matter experts, is that while that information was super cool and interesting, if I happen to be a military contractor, I'm a plumber, supporting the military in a war zone and i'm driving down a dirt road to go do some plumbing work over at that base over there right and i'm driving down this road and 100 yards ahead of me i see a bump in a road right and i'm thinking gosh is that an improvised explosive device that might kill me in that moment i don't really care about the history of gunpowder i don't care about how it was used hundreds of years ago for fireworks i don't care how it was made none of that is relevant At the end of the day, what I care about is not dying. And so this is a great example where if we would have included all of that interesting, nice to know information, while it might have been interesting, by the time the learners got through all of that, they might have been disengaged and checked out from the training. And then they would have never got the information they actually needed to save their lives, right? And so learners don't need to know things. They need to be able to do things on the job. And this is why it's so important to understand that knowledge and behavior aren't mutually exclusive. Just because you give your learners more knowledge doesn't mean it's going to result in more behaviors or different behaviors on the job. I'll give you a great example. You know, I've been trying for the last two years during the whole pandemic, I've been trained to lose 30 pounds. And I've lost weight before. I know how to lose weight. I know I need to eat less, eat better, exercise more, right? I need to change how I live my life day to day. But I haven't been doing that for some reason, right? Maybe I'm not motivated or maybe because working from home, the environment that I live and work in is conducive to not exercising as much as I should or eating as well as I should. Or maybe it's because, you know, I have this app on my phone where I can order food and it just comes to my door, right? There's no amount of knowledge that's going to change my behavior. I know how to lose weight. 
It's a behavioral issue, right? And so just because you give your learners more information, more knowledge, it doesn't mean that they're gonna do things differently on the job. We need to create opportunities for practice and get people doing the things we want them to be doing. The way that we do that in an e-learning context is we design performance-based e-learning interactions. We design e-learning that gets people practicing the things we want them to actually do on the job. I'll give you a great example. Here's a, uh, a great non-example, actually. Uh, here's a screenshot from my very first e-learning project uh, that I mentioned to you earlier where we were creating a course on how to cut shoplifters. Uh, this was my first project. It was uh, created in PowerPoint because that was all that was available to me in a, a program called Articulate Studio, uh, which was before Storyline. You, you take your PowerPoints and convert it into e-learning. And I created this course with all these awful bullet points and these really awful stock photos. Trust me, that's not how shoplifters actually look like uh, when they're shoplifting. And I remember my boss and my coworker at the time said, you know, Tim, what you really need to do is you need to make your courses interactive in order to make it engaging. So I thought, oh, okay, what I'll do is I'll take my information and I'll add these buttons on the screen. You see those buttons along the bottom there? And the learner will click a button and it'll reveal some content to them, right? They're gonna learn about the five steps of catching a shoplifter. And I thought, great, done. I made it interactive, now it's engaging. But the problem with that is, is if you take a look at that, ask yourself, uh, what actual knowledge or skill does the learner actually need to apply to complete that interaction? Well, the only thing the learner really needs to know how to do to complete it is know how to use their mouse and their cursor to click a button. There's really nothing gained from that sort of interaction where the learner clicks and reveals some content to them, right? Whatever that content might be. And so what we need to be doing less of is using click to reveal interactions thinking it's gonna result in performance. It doesn't mean click to reveal interactions don't offer value. There's a time and place for those. That's a separate conversation. But what we need to do is stop using them with the expectation that it's going to drive performance. So let me give you some different examples. Uh, so this example, this is from a course I created um, when I used to work at a, a call center at a technology company. I managed um, an instructional design team there. And one of the things that we had to teach our call center agents was how to use the CRM. So when a customer would call in, it would bring up their account and they could see their call history and their entire account. And one of the very specific things that these call center agents needed to be able to do was identify whether or not a customer has called in previously. And the reason why that was so important is it would change the way they interacted with them throughout the call. And the way they would identify whether or not a customer's called in about a particular issue before is they would look at the history down at the bottom. So what we did is we mocked up a CRM just like this and we asked them a series of simple questions. We say, look at the CRM, look at the history and identify, is this a new case or a repeat interaction? So what they had to do is they had to read through the case history to understand that. And then they'd simply select new case or repeat interaction. Is this a complicated uh, interaction? No, it's a glorified multiple choice question. E even simpler than that, it's a glorified true false question. But what it required the learner to do was to actually practice the thing that we were expecting them to do on the job. Look at the case history, read the case notes, and identify is it a new case or repeat interaction. That was just one particular task that we practiced. And then later on in the course, one of the things that they needed to be able to do was to read the case notes. So in a call center, you know, when a customer hangs up and the call ends, most call center agents only have a few short seconds, like 15, 30 seconds to type their case notes into the CRM. So what they do is they use shorthand, they'll use abbreviations, and it's important that they include all of the relevant information. So what we did is we had our learners in the course listen to a real call. They'd click on the little headphones there, listen to a real call, and then identify which of those case notes included the proper information to describe what happened in that call. Again, it got them practicing listening to a call, reading different case notes, and identifying whether or not those case notes actually included uh, the right information. And then what we did from there is we actually had the learner practice writing their own case notes. So what they would do is they would, again, listen to a call, and then they would practice typing in their own case notes, ideally typing in uh, all of the right and accurate information. Now, for those of you, this was built in Storyline. For those of you familiar with Storyline or Captivate or any other e-learning authoring tool, it can be a challenge evaluating an open-ended question like this, right? Because the learner can type in anything. Every question, every answer might be a little bit different, right? So rather than us saying whether or not they got it right or wrong, which would have been really uh, difficult to achieve, what we had to do, what we had the learner do is self-evaluate. So they would click submit, and then we would show them what they typed in there on the left, and on the right, we would show our recommended case note. 
and they would self-evaluate whether or not they included all the right details and information in the case note. These are great examples where creating performance-based, decision-based e-learning doesn't require a lot of complicated features. It's just about how you position uh, the content and, and the skills that you're trying to teach. And a lot of times it's just a matter of creating glorified multiple choice questions or simple, simple, simple simulations that they can practice these things. I'll give you another example. Here is a course uh, that I created years ago when I was still working in retail. And this was the original content. And the, the thing that we needed our learners to be able to do uh, was uh, our store employees each year, they'd go through inventory and they'd have to take these inventory tags, these area tickets is what they're called. And they'd have to put them throughout the store in a very particular order uh, for inventory purposes. And this was the original content. And we found that our learners always struggled with actually taking these three simple bullet points placing inventory tags in numerical order on fixtures from front to back, left to right, department walls, tag last. They had a hard time actually performing that task on the job, or at least taking the information and performing it on the job. And so what we did is we repositioned how we presented it. We first, we showed them an example of how to actually do it. So it was taking those three bullet points and rather than just telling it to them, showing them what we were talking about. And then what that allowed us to do was to create like a drag and drop interaction. So we were to create a drag and drop where they could practice doing this in an e-learning environment with all sorts of different departments using a 3D mock-up of the store. And that helped them prepare themselves to actually go do it properly on the actual sales floor. So again, it's a simple example of how you reposition what it is that you're creating to base it in performance. All right, so as you move forward, whether you're creating e-learning or any other type of training, what you have to ask yourself is the next time you're asked, can we create some training? You need to ask yourself, is it designed for how people learn? Am I designing something that's optimized for how people actually learn? Is it the right solution for the performance issue that we're trying to solve? And is it designed for what people need to do? If the answer is no to any of these questions, it's an indicator you need to go back and rethink what you're doing. If you can say yes to these, then you're going on the right path, all right? So, um, if you want to learn more about <laughs> designing e-learning that doesn't suck, I'd encourage you all to check out my book, The E-Learning Designer's Handbook. It's on the Amazon. I'll put a link down in the description. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for watching. And as I mentioned, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, if you haven't done so already, make sure to click that like, subscribe, and that bell button so you'll get alerted the next time uh, I publish a video like this one. And of course, uh, if you're not already there, join us inside the E-Learning Designer's community at community.elearningacademy.io. I'll put a link down in the description as well where you can connect and network with others in our industry. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching today's how-to workshop. My name is Tim Slade, and until next time, I'll see you around.